All right. Um, I did get a chance to meet a lot of you in previous years, and it's nice to see you again. Um, it's nice to see everyone in person again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about best practices for um, data sharing. And for some reason, the slide is off the edge. Um, let me see if I can fix that display setting. Um, so there we go. Um, it's just the escape button always works. Um, so this is probably not the most stimulating talk that you're going to hear today. The slides are up online. It is just a necessary part of our practice as researchers collecting networks and health data. And um, there's really no need to take notes because everything is up on the website if you want to grab it. So I'm going to keep this short. I know that everybody has had a long day. We're in the middle of the week, so this will be about 10, 15 minutes. And if you want to stop me at any point along the way, please go ahead. So, and then if you do grab the um, slides from the website, all of the citations for the different slides are at the bottom of each slide, so you'll have everything. So this comes out of a new NIH policy for data sharing. And um, much of the data that we collect for research needs to be kept confidential to protect the privacy of the subjects or cohort members in our study. And so data owners typically um, employ one of several strategies to share data so that they can protect the privacy of the subjects. And I'll talk about these strategies today and the new policy. So as of January 25th of this year, NIH has required a data management and sharing plan with submissions as part of the rigor and reproducibility initiatives. And to make sure that we're all behaving ethically as researchers and also to protect the investment that NIH makes when they fund all of us to collect these data, they really want an ethical data sharing policy and that's now part of any new submission. So the data management and sharing or the DMS plan needs to include a description of the data that are generated per the funding that's given, a management plan for those data, and now also a sharing plan. And then there's a link to that policy here. Along with the guidance, NIH also released sample data management and sharing plans contributed by various institutes and centers, and those are in the third column here. But the thing is that none of the plans pertain specifically to network data. And that's problematic because relational data, such as network data, not only carry a higher risk of deductive disclosure, but they also are a unique case because there's an edge list and an attribute file. It's not just your standard rows and columns that you would see with other types of data. So if you're not familiar with the concept of deductive disclosure, the um, ICPSR link that's the first one at the bottom is an excellent resource for just data sharing in general. And it's when a combination of not singly identifying attributes can be combined so that you can re-identify someone in your data set. So without a single identifier, combining 15 different demographic attributes that could be considered aggregate data in a table would effectively identify every single US citizen. And that's um, described in the second citation. And then the third citation describes fallout from the Netflix prize. So um, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, Netflix, Netflix released an anonymized data set of half a million different users because they wanted people to compete to develop a better algorithm for recommendations for them. Instead of developing an algorithm to, um, to improve recommendations for Netflix, two computer scientists who were at UT Austin at the time used those data, combined it with IMBD ratings that they scraped off the website, and then developed an algorithm to show that they could re-identify the users in the Netflix prize data set. Then they went a step further, and they also combined all of the re-identified users with political preferences and other information that they were able to find online that could be considered sensitive. So relational data, such as network data, carries an even higher risk of deductive disclosure because of the aspect of the relations. So I, as a 45-year-old woman, 45-year-old white woman, doesn't seem very unique. But once I'm married to a 52-year-old white man, and especially if I live in this area or we share a household, it becomes a narrower and narrower set of people where you can re-identify them. The same two computer scientists from the UT Austin, who were at UT Austin for the Netflix Prize, also anonymized a data set of Twitter users from data that they got off of scraping Twitter data, <laughs> combined it with Flickr data, and then also showed that they were able to successfully re-identify one-third of those users with only a 12% error rate. 
because now they've got all of those relations. So relational data are those in which the richness of the data comes from looking at the closeness among the units in the data set. So in addition to network data, geospatial and genetic data can also be analyzed as relations. So there's some value in the unique individual level data, but there's often more value in analyzing how the values relate to each other. So geospatial data in particular is something that is usually used because we have such a good sense of geospatial data, but genetic data will get there at some point where it really narrows down who someone might be because you're limiting the set of people. So the reference at the bottom here um, from the Office of Management and Budget is a good one for data sharing concerns, even if it isn't specific to network data. So to protect the privacy of the people in the data set, given the risk of deductive disclosure, there are several strategies that are commonly employed for clinical data sharing but those might not work as well on relational data. So I'm going to talk about some of those. So these are some of these common strategies. Um, any strategy for data sharing has to balance utility, reproducibility, and privacy. And then utility addresses the richness of the data for people who want to repurpose it for secondary analyses or additional analyses. The ability to reproduce the analyses published or disseminated to ensure that the rigor in the analysis is one of NIH's big pushes in the past few years. And then, of course, the privacy of the people in the cohort is the key concern. So I'm going to talk about these different strategies. I'll go through how the balance for utility, reproducibility, and privacy tips for relational data. So the first strategy is aggregation. And that reduces data to what you'd commonly see in a clinical table one, where you're looking at just the marginal probabilities of people. Um, so it's when the proportions are calculated for a variable of interest. And you can also do this with network statistics in the same way, when you're looking at density or some kind of aggregated network statistic. So I'm not an ad health user, but I understand that that is something that's done when people um, when people are getting an individual level data set, they'll also get some of the network statistics as well. And, um, and I appreciate um, Jimmy Adams for telling me that and then Jim for confirming it right now with a head nod. So aggregation is obviously really highly protective for the subjects, but the utility, the repurposing is really, really low. The ability to conduct additional analyses, to um, reproduce what was already done is affected by aggregating. And then that balance is similar for network data. It's highly protective but there's not very much utility or ability to check the rigor. Um, <clears throat> partial reporting is when only a small percentage or some proportion of the data are shared. So in the case of a rare outcome or a rare trait, you might still be able to re-identify someone in the data set. Um, and there are some, um, some particular attributes. So we suppress um, ethnic racial categories in Eastern North Carolina when we're looking at HIV data. We usually say um, you know, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, Hispanic Latinx, and other, because we have such a low proportion of people of other ethnicities and races. It does impact the reproducibility of some relational um, analyses, but it's commonly used for genomic data because the genetic data have a lot of utility in and of themselves but you can break some of the deductive links for disclosure. So when we're um, putting HIV sequences up in a repository, we won't put our entire cohort there because you will still have the value of the sequence, but you wouldn't be able to link all of those people together and get enough sampling co coverage that you can re-identify. There is actually a very specific um, NIH genomic data policy, <coughs> excuse me, from about 10 years ago, and they do